This is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 045. Welcome, everyone. My name is Joe Chaffin. I'm really glad that you're here today. I just want to let you know right up front that this is not a continuing education episode. You can check bbguy.org and transfusionnews.com to look for episodes ending with the letters CE. And those are the episodes that are continuing education for you to get credit. Those CE episodes are provided by Transfusion News with generous sponsorship from BioRad, who, by the way, have no editorial input into the content. You know, I almost can't believe that I get to introduce today's podcast guest. When you think about people who have truly made an impact in transfusion medicine, people who have been at the forefront of new and exciting frontiers in our field, there really are not many who are more deserving of the title of giant than Dr. Harvey Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein is the chief of the Department of Transfusion Medicine at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and he has been chief there since 1984. His honors were which are really too numerous to count and include, well, let's see, he's a former ABB president. He's co-author of the 12th edition of uh, a great book, Mollison's Blood Transfusion in Clinical Medicine. And most recently at the 2017 AABB annual meeting, he was awarded, uh, I believe, AABB's highest award, which is the Bernard Fantas Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, but, you know, I contacted Harvey initially because I wanted to talk about an article that, that he and a couple of co-authors had written in the New England Journal of Medicine about the current and future state of transfusion medicine. And we are going to discuss that in the interview you're about to hear. But I realized really quickly that Harvey just has so many things to say, and he's been so heavily involved in so many amazing things since he got to the NIH in 1973, that I just wanted to hear all about them too. So today's interview is really about past, present, and future through the eyes of a giant of transfusion medicine. So now I get to say seven words that I thought I would would never actually get to say, and here they are. You ready? Here's my interview with Dr. Harvey Klein. Well, hi, Harvey. Welcome to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. You know, I, when I first started this this podcast uh, in 2016, there were a few people that were that were on my list of uh, boy, that'll never happen. But I'd love to get uh, that person on the podcast. And I have to admit, Harvey, you are right at the top of that list. So I, I'm I'm unbelievably honored that you would spend this time with me. Well, thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> ah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> So many people that listen to this podcast are are just kind of starting, just kind of getting started in the field and may not know a whole lot, a whole lot about transfusion medicine. And you are someone who's, as I said, has such an incredible background. I wonder if you just give us the thumbnail on what got you started in transfusion medicine and, and what got you interested in what kind of keeps you going in it today. Sure. Well, I was a newly minted hematologist in 1973 when uh, the Vietnam War was hot and heavy. And uh, I came to the National Institutes of Health as my uh, obligate service. And as a hematologist, I came to the newly founded blood division of the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And I had the good fortune of being in the division with uh, Dr. Ernie Simon, who had just arrived at the same time. And Dr. Simon was also a hematologist, but his work had been done in storage of red cells in uh, the University of Washington in Seattle. And he convinced me that one of the areas in hematology of real opportunity was in blood transfusion, especially for someone who was a clinician, because most of the transfusionists at the time were pathologists and were much more laboratory-oriented than patient-oriented, and that's how I got into the area. Well, I came here for two years just for the obligate service and actually still had a position at Johns Hopkins where I trained waiting for me. But uh, it was such a great place to be. I met the people in the hospital, uh, Dr. Harvey Alter, Dr. Paul Holland, who were doing blood transfusion. And the idea of being at a place where you could do translational research, and that was the product, uh, was just so attractive 
to me that I came for two years and that was uh, 43 years ago. <laughs> well, you, you, I, th- I think you might, you, you might be fairly well established there then. Well, I'm probably a lifer. <laughs> <laughs> that makes total sense. Well, in that time, Harvey, you, you, have, you have not only seen, but you've been kind of at the epicenter of a whole bunch of what I would describe as paradigm shifts, sea changes, just big things that have happened in our field. And, and I wanted to talk to you about just a, f- a few of them, um, it, some of which are obviously big, huge, and widely known, and at least one of which is 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 one that I, I think is a great bit of, of trivia, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But I want to start with the, the very first one that's, wow, it, it, I think everyone would agree uh, has completely changed what we do in transfusion medicine over the years and that is that that is the the discovery of of HIV um, and uh, HIV being transmitted through blood transfusion and again I know you were you and the NIH were were very much involved in in that whole process I wonder if you would if you would tell us the story a little bit about your involvement and your perspective on that sure well that was another great thing about being at the NIH whereas the uh, extramural people have to apply for grants the people who are here at NIH have a research budget, and it's fairly flexible in that we are reviewed after we've done our research every four years. So we're very flexible, and when HIV, before it was known as HIV, appeared on the horizon as a rare disease, we actually were able to import people to the clinical center, the hospital here at NIH, and begin looking at this very unusual disease. And I was fortunate in that I had a, uh, a young collaborator here for other areas by the name of Anthony Fauci, who uh, has gone on to other things, as most people know, but was one of the real movers uh, for HIV. And he was the one who imported these patients from Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco, a rare disease. It's hard to. It's a little bit hard for for people that are obviously newer in the field to to understand the the import of all that 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 happened back then. But I mean, how how did you become aware that something was going on in the in the in the blood supply? Well, it was. Uh, there were a couple of papers that were published that suggested that this immune deficiency could be acquired and could be acquired by people who had been exposed to blood components. For example, uh, patients with hemophilia and uh, children, and there was certainly one in uh, Los Angeles who'd received a platelet transfusion, a neonate, and developed an immunodeficiency syndrome. And so we had been very interested, as you know, in post-transfusion hepatitis, and this smelled as if it could be a transmissible disease, although there were lots of other ideas about how this disease came about, an immunosuppressive effect of blood, uh, all kinds of, uh, of, of ideas. And uh, we had uh, a primate model as well as the ability to study patients here. And so we were ideally situated to investigate this very rare disease at the time. And of course, it turned out to be not so rare at all. <sighs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think it's difficult for people, for people who have who didn't live through that, and that was slightly before my career in transfusion medicine started a, a few years before. Um, it's it's difficult for people to understand the, kind of the before and after, and and without, I, I mean, I know I, we could talk about this for an hour easily, but I. I, I I guess what I'm curious about from your perspective is you've seen the before and after with with HIV. And how how do you feel that that experience has colored the way we do things today? Well, unfortunately, it's colored it in a variety of uh, ways, some of which are are good and some of which are bad. I'll tell you the bad first. And the bad is that at the time, blood centers around the country were involved in all kinds of developmental research. The advent of, uh, of AIDS resulted in a lot of the research budgets being applied to regulatory issues. And so a lot of the centers that had been doing research were not doing research anymore. And that's, that's a shame. 
the uh, the interesting thing, of course, was that this was a brand new disease so with a, a, an incredible uh, 100% mortality at the time, or so we thought, in a long, silent period, and uh, immune suppression such as we had never seen before. And here at NIH, where we had a primate model for post-transfusion hepatitis, we were able to take specimens from patients who had this rare disease, put them into the primates, and actually demonstrate for the very first time that whatever this entity was, it could be transmitted by transfusion. The other very interesting thing that we had here was the ability to look at twins, one of which had AIDS and the other of which did not. So they were discrepant for AIDS. And we actually did transplants from the twin who had a or the the twin who was healthy to the twin who had AIDS and demonstrated that AIDS could disappear and the immunity could uh, return but then several months later the patient became immune suppressed again again demonstrating that in fact this was something that was transmissible that uh, uh, was probably infectious so these were uh, these were exciting times even though they were disastrous times for the patients who were infected. Oh, wow. I, you know, before before we leave this, again, there's so much more we could, we could talk about, but there, we have a lot to cover today. I, there is one thing that has always bothered me, and I wanted to give, the, give you the opportunity to address it. Uh, and I, I don't know how to say this delicately, but I'll, so I'll just say it. There has been um, in the press um, and in movies and, and other, other presentations some discussion that perhaps the, uh, perhaps the blood industry or perhaps scientists in general did not pursue HIV as, as aggressively as they might have out of some sort of uh, fear or homophobia or something along those lines. And I'm guessing you probably have fairly strong feelings on that, but I just wanted to give you the chance to, to, to tell me what those feelings were. Yeah, I, and I feel that that's really a totally incorrect perception. And I was here at the epicenter. It was really unclear as to what the cause of this rare disease was. And obviously, we became became uh, very quickly knowledgeable that it, it wasn't rare at all. But there was a, a great concern that if one did the wrong thing, one could paralyze the entire blood collection system. And so we really, we asked for more data perhaps to demonstrate that this was in fact transmissible by blood than we would today, certainly. So I, I would totally disagree that homophobia or fear of this entity had anything to do with the progress of the research. In fact, in many ways, certainly at NIH and at many other institutions, it was just the opposite. This was such an interesting phenomenon that you wanted to be sure that the tragedy didn't escape you for just looking at this, again, brand new entity, something that had never been seen before. And when it appeared that perhaps a retrovirus caused it, well, we all knew that retroviruses did not cause human disease. So again, this, these were things that it's really hard now to look back on and say, well, that was intuitively obvious, because believe me, it was not. That's there's again so much more we could talk about with that, but I I want to move on unless there's anything else you wanted to to say about that before we move on. Harvey. Well, I think the only thing that I want to say is that clearly that influenced how we address infectious diseases from then on. Certainly in in the blood community, because as most people know, there were not only um, trials but there were criminal trials for leaders of the blood community in many countries. Not in the United States, but uh, people were jailed uh, because of their role in uh, blood transfusion around that period of time. So we're now extraordinarily cautious at even the thought of an infectious disease coming into the blood supply today. So that's been a total sea change in how we address risk in blood transfusion. I would like to move on, Harvey, to to the next to our next 
point of discussion on on historical stuff because again uh, in, incredible things that you've that you've seen and, and been through and so, stuff that we take for granted today such as the use of blood cell separators I, and that that's fascinating to me that uh, that that hasn't always been around because for all of my career it's been a part of what we've been able to do but you saw the development of that a little bit before you got to NIH and a lot after you got to NIH could you take us through that a little bit sure well let me tell you the story at the clinical center here at NIH which is really uh, an exciting story there was a a young patient a 12 year old with acute leukemia who uh, was in the clinical center and whose father George Judson was an engineer at IBM and uh, Mr. Judson came down to NIH to visit his son and his son who was getting chemotherapy was thrombocytopenic and leukopenic and he came through the blood bank to see how we made platelets and saw that we put bags of blood into a centrifuge and spun them down and collected platelets and he wondered why you couldn't hook the centrifuge up to a patient or a donor and collect cells from them whether it were leukemic cells or cells for transfusion and so he uh put forth this idea to Jay Freireich, who was with the Cancer Institute, and IBM gave him a year of leave to come to the NIH, work with the Cancer Institute with Freireich, and develop the IBM NCI blood cell separator, which was the first blood cell separator that used both arms, a continuous flow blood cell separator. And of course, it's been used for everything else since that time. I arrived on the scene just at about the time that this had been commercialized. Prior to that, uh, people were making parts in their laboratories and putting them together and uh, putting animals on these uh, machines. And so the the rest in many ways is history in that we used it for uh, plasma exchanges and for uh, collecting progenitor cells and lymphocytes and all kinds of things. Now, my own personal... Uh, involvement is again an interesting one in that uh, I had been working with Jack Latham at Hemonetics who had a discontinuous flow blood cell separator the Hemonetics Model 30 that used one arm and I had read about two patients in South Africa with sickle cell disease who had had red cell exchanges and the second patient became semi-comatose during the exchange and so they published this experience and said you should never do this in patients with sickle cell disease. You changed the 2,3 DPG levels and the patients weren't delivering oxygen to the brain. Well, the beauty of being at NIH is that you could actually study that. And so I got together with one of my colleagues from Johns Hopkins, who was here at NIH at the time, Dr. Robert Winslow. We had a number of sickle cell patients. And in those days, it was much easier. You got informed consent from the patient. You took your blood cell separator and you plumbed it any way you wanted. There were no uh, controls or automated features on the, it was just a central in a couple of pumps, and instead of doing plasma exchanges or platelet collections, you did a red cell exchange. And so we did red cell exchanges in these patients, but we measured the oxygen delivery and demonstrated that while the DPG levels went down and the oxygen dissociation curves shifted, the change in the viscosity of the blood was so profound when you put in stored blood cells compared to sickle cells that oxygen delivery actually improved. And we went on to do a variety of other studies in this patient population uh, showing that in fact it improved oxygen delivery to a variety of organs. So those were the first automated blood cell, red cell exchanges in the Western Hemisphere, certainly in the United States, but in the entire Western Hemisphere, and really uh, popularized this treatment. Now, as a house officer at Johns Hopkins, I'd stayed up all night doing manual red cell exchanges. (laughs) Who does that anymore? So in many ways, this was self-interest, I think. (laughs) (laughs) That makes total sense. (laughs) Wow. I mean, and again, that 
from that from those beginnings the technology has changed so i mean it's changed dramatically in a way but it's still kind of based on the same principles that that you guys saw developed there at nih right it's exactly right and we did a number of very novel things some of which worked and some of which didn't work so well but we presented them at uh, national meetings and at a national meeting held by the red cross uh, in chicago uh, four of us got together and said, you know, this business of blood cell separators and different diseases, we should form a society. And an Englishman by the name of John Verrier Jones, who was actually a rheumatologist using plasma exchange and lupus, and Alvaro Pineda from the Mayo Clinic, who was doing a variety of things, and Duke Casperson from the Red Cross, and I formed ASFA uh, there in Chicago uh, after a Red Cross symposium on blood cell separators. And again, that's become a very influential society in terms of advancing the uh, cell separation technology. Mm-hmm. To say the least, to say the least. So uh, in, incredible, incredible discoveries and accomplishments. I, and I, again, th- there's a lot more that we could talk about there as well. But the next one is one that I that I really wanted to talk to you about simply because I'm not sure I was aware of this before I started uh, before I started researching our, our discussion today. And that's that's simply this. Um you are, well, your blood bank is the original transfusion medicine service in the world. And, and I'm, I'm amazed at that. Uh, you, you, were, you were the one who first suggested in, in an editorial in, uh, or an article at least in JAMA in, two, in 1987, I believe, that transfusion medicine was a more appropriate way to describe what we and what, has, what had been called prior to that blood banking were doing. Take us through a little bit what led to that thought process and, and what led you to, to I, again, I know the phrase didn't completely originate with you, but you're the, you and your blood bank were the first ones to, to, to propagate it. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, as I said earlier, I was a practicing hematologist and a clinician, and it was actually attending on this hematology services several months of the year here at the clinical center, as well as uh, acting as the deputy chief and then finally chief of uh, blood transfusion. And it occurred to me that blood bank was an archaic term. And so I went back and looked up how it had uh, evolved and what blood banking meant. And 1987 was the uh, 50th anniversary of the American blood bank, at least uh, what people considered the founding of the American blood bank in Chicago. And I thought that that was a term that was archaic, that we did much more than bank blood, that we, we went out and took care of patients. We did call consultations. And so I sat down with a a number of my staff and I can remember sitting in the cafeteria here at NIH saying, we really ought to change the name of this discipline. Blood banking just isn't sufficient. Harvey Alter was there. Rick Davey was there. uh, Joel Solomon was there, uh, who was the former CEO of the AABB. He worked for me for a while. And we kicked around names. And the Russians used a term called transfusiology, and uh, that came up, and we said, that would be terrible. That would really be terrible. But then I remembered, yes, thank goodness we didn't do. But then I remembered that I had talked uh, with uh, Tibby Greenwald a couple of years earlier, and he told me that the Germans had a term, transfusionsmedizin, transfusion medicine. And I said, you know, that really fits. The Germans do have a word for it. Uh, Why don't we use the term transfusion medicine for our department? And uh, that was the genesis of applying that term, which wasn't original with me. And uh, the idea of writing that editorial in 1987 at the 50th anniversary of the American Blood Bank. Well, I'm I'm curious, how was it received? Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it was not particularly well received. A number of <laughs> pathologists, first of all, thought, who is this young guy uh, who's trying to tell us what we ought to call ourselves? A number of the blood centers said that, uh, you know, you don't really include us appropriately. And after all, we collect all of the blood in the United States. And so there was a, a bit of a... Um, a, a 
a pushback. But then the uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute instituted a program for training people in transfusion medicine. And their influence, I think, really popularized the term far better than, than my uh, editorial in JAMA, which I think has been largely lost to uh, posterity, except for your mention. Thank you. Well, no problem. I'm happy to happy to pump that article. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and and actually, I was I was sitting here thinking as as you were talking. Um, you know, obviously, the, this my my website and and this podcast goes. I I have the moniker Blood Bank Guy, and I'm I was just thinking. I don't think Transfusiology Guy would have quite have the same ring. So, so. <laughs> no, thank goodness we abandoned that very quickly. And there were a couple of other names that were equally either pretentious or ridiculous, and we had the good sense <laughs> not to use them. <laughs> good call. Good call. Well, I want to I want to close this part, the kind of the past part of our discussion, with with something that's that moves from the past into the present, and that's um, and that is genotyping and and the role of the role of uh, molecular testing in transfusion medicine. That again is is not is not new. It's been around for a while, but is starting perhaps to become uh, well, not just perhaps start. It's starting to become more and more widely used. So take us through a little bit your experience with and your involvement in kind of the the movement of of uh, transfusion medicine towards molecular. Well, I had always thought, as did many other people, that in, in many ways this was the first personalized medicine. We actually did phenotyping, and here at NIH, we had, I think, the first computerized donor records where we had uh, 20 antigens by phenotype, and uh, we could call in donors based on their phenotypic profile. And so the idea of having personalized transfusion uh, was certainly common to many of us in this discipline. And the idea that you could uh, somehow go a step further than the phenotype and actually do the genotype, which you would obviously only have to do once. And uh, if you had technology, you could, uh, again, computerize this and not have to worry about having rare reagents that at the time that we started here, we made most of our own reagents, whether they were reagent red cells or whether they were uh, antibodies from uh, blood donors. And we shared them around the country, and frequently you couldn't get the cells or the antibodies you wanted. So this was an example of you needed the biology to advance, and you needed the technology to advance. And one without the other was useless. And finally, uh, you know, the human genome uh, project, I think, has brought this to the consciousness of many people. We now call it, I guess, precision medicine, although that's a little different than personalized medicine. And the technology is clearly here, as is the, uh, the biology. We know so much more now about the genes at the RH locus and some of the other uh, genes that aren't quite as simple as uh, we originally thought they might be. Now, we, by the way, have just submitted the uh, a question to the FDA as to whether we can label our blood for the first time uh, with the genotype for the RHDEL, uh, label it as RHDEL. And that, if they approve, that would be, I think, the first labeling in the United States by genotype. Oh, wow. That, and again, that, that is a big change. So just, Harvey, for, for those that are just beginning in, in our field, can you the, give me like a one minute what RHDEL means? Well, these uh, are donors or patients who test RH positive in one laboratory and RH negative in another laboratory. And it turns out that they have a very weak D. And this comes up all the time. A patient or a donor comes to you and says, you know, I'm RH positive, but they say I'm RH negative. And it turns out that this is a, uh, a genetic change that results in a very small amount of uh, RHD antigen being present. So much so that you find it serologically by eluding the antibody off of the, uh, the red cell. So DEL is D 
eluding or elution uh, is the way it's, it's gotten its name. But then if you look at the genetic net level, you know exactly what the genetic change is. And so you can label it without worrying that this laboratory test is incorrect or this other laboratory test uh, serologically is, is, is incorrect. Uh, you can actually look at the gene. I think that I I'd like to I'd like to transition Harvey if you're if you're willing to go with me into into a little bit from that discussion into kind of the uh, more the present and and where we are now in terms of you mentioned the whole personalized medicine precision medicine and I think it's it's really inarguable that in in things like serology in in blood banking and in, in transfusion medicine, we are we're getting more and more advanced. There's no no doubt about that. However, I have I have heard you I have heard and read things that you have said about your feelings on where we're going with how we do certain things, like for example, transfusing red cells. And I think it's safe for me to summarize your feeling in that you're concerned that we're actually moving backwards in how we're in how we're transfusing, making the decisions to transfuse red cells. So I wonder if I wonder if you would take us through your feelings on that and uh, perhaps start from wherever you feel like it in terms of when you first got concerned about this and, and what you see as the potential problem. Well, first, let me say that I think when we look at the product, the red cell, increasingly we've had the technology technology to be able to characterize it so much better that we're now able, if we wish, to match patient and donor at a very, very basic level, at the level of the gene, so that I anticipate that in the not-too-distant future, and some centers are already doing this, all of our donors will be genotyped, all of our patients will be genotyped, perhaps their entire genome, but at least at the red cell locus. And using the uh, informatics that we have today, we'll be able to do much better transfusion in terms of the best match of red cell and patient. But the other end is, of course, when should you transfuse and how should you make the transfusion decision? And I think most of us who, again, are clinicians believe that you should be able to select patients based on their disease and their clinical status and determine when you ought to transfuse red cells. But increasingly, we're not doing that. More commonly, we're using algorithms or we're using a transfusion trigger transfusion of trigger of 7 grams of hemoglobin or 10 grams of hemoglobin. I became concerned about this when the first paper came out talking about liberal transfusion and restrictive transfusion. That was back in the 90s with intensive care patients. And people talked about randomized control trials. And I would say that I don't believe there are any randomized controlled trials. There are randomized clinical trials. But of all the trials of red cell transfusion, you will have to tell me where the control is. I don't see a control. A control to me is the standard practice that someone is doing compared with your innovation, compared with what it is that you're going to test. So that if I were going to design a trial to see whether restrictive transfusion was superior to standard transfusion, I would want to take patients who are getting the transfusions as they were given back in the 1990s by the physicians at the hospitals where we were testing this stuff as the control and randomize them to using a hemoglobin of seven as the test trigger. Mm-hmm. Now, my problem you is... Mean as a, that's, Harvey, I'm sorry to interrupt. You mean as opposed to the two extremes? Exactly. What we I have see. is two relatively arbitrarily uh, selected triggers. One is seven and one is ten. Now, there's been other trials where the number is slightly different, but the concept is the same. Now, when I think about that, suppose, for example, that you had a dozen deaths in your seven arm and a dozen deaths in your ten arm, and you'd say, well, 
they're equal. So there must be no difference in using these as triggers, but that's not necessarily so. It may well be that in your seven arm, you've restricted patients whom you would ordinarily transfuse. Elderly patients with coronary artery disease in distress, and you've given them seven, even though the standard of care at the time would never have been to restrict them to seven. Some of them perhaps died. In your other arm, your 10 arm, you may have relatively young patients who were ill but had good cardiovascular disease uh, status, good pulmonary status, and you're going to transfuse them even though ordinarily you wouldn't do that. But that arm says transfuse a 10, so that's what you do. Some of them might die from taco, from volume overload. So they're dying from different kinds of things. And if you had given the older patient transfusion and the younger, healthier patient no transfusion, then you might have had a better outcome with standard of practice than you had in either one of those. Now, I'm not saying that you would. What I'm saying is that has never been tested. So we don't know, really, that a restrictive transfusion is, is better in general than a standard of care. So let me let me ask you this, Harvey, and and I I want to push back maybe just a little, but because I mean I was I was practicing in the nineties, and and I would I would say that I experienced, and this is totally anecdotal. I realize this, but I experienced a ton of clinicians who believed in the old quote unquote ten thirty rule, transfusing at a hemoglobin threshold of ten or a hematocrit threshold of thirty, and they. I felt like anyway that my arguments about using other clinical parameters fell on deaf ears in many cases. So so l- let me ask you this. How would you respond to someone that says, uh, do we have any idea how clinicians – and I, I realize your, your background is a clinician, so I don't mean to offend you with this – but do we have any data that suggests how – that? Clinicians actually did use clinical information other than the the quote unquote triggers before TRIC came out, for example, in 1999. And, and this is the disturbing part because, in fact, we did. So that actually Paul A. Bear, who uh, was the lead author on the TRIC trial, surveyed appropriately, and this was in Canada, surveyed clinicians. And the way he did this is he gave them four different scenarios and said, what would you do under this scenario? And one of them was, uh, again, cardiovascular disease. Uh, And what he found is that almost no one would transfuse the younger, healthier patient, and almost everyone would transfuse the older patient with cardiovascular disease. So while he didn't actually show that this is what they did, what he showed in a paper that was published prior to the TRIC trial is that this is what they said they would do. So I think there were at least some data to suggest that people didn't use the old 1030 rule, which by the way is widely misquoted. That was never (laughs) a rule and it was never put forth by the uh, original paper as as a rule for all patients. Uh, What the rule was, if it were a rule, is said that if you have a patient going to surgery and they're very ill, it might be prudent to transfuse them up to a hemoglobin of 10. That became the 1030 rule. Well, kind of like the the 20,000 platelet rule was never intended to be a rule in the original paper, right? Absolutely. I think frequently uh, these are misquoted. And uh, one of my former mentors used to say that if something is in the literature for 15 years, nobody reads it anymore. And and it's true. (laughs) And it's a shame because uh, sometimes uh, we get our ideas inappropriately from something we heard someone say when they misquote a paper. Yes. Well, so you you have recently um, you've published several several things on your concerns about um, about 
the the trials in transfusion medicine, including uh, an excellent uh, editorial that that was I'm um, uh, forgive me I don't have it right in front of me, but it was a pre- precision versus imprecision. Forgive me, Harvey, I can't remember exactly what it was called. Yes, uh, transfusion medicine. Precision versus imprecision medicine. Thank you, thank you. So, and you also were involved in a paper um, w- with uh, Dr. Deans as well on the relevance of what you call practice misalignments to, to trials in transfusion medicine. And I'm assuming that by tra- practice misalignments, what you're referring to is that um, is transfusing people in a way that you wouldn't normally, in- as according to the standard of care. Is that a, the correct summary? That's that's exactly right. And therefore, if you do that and compare two arms where you're transfusing people in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily transfuse them, then you really can't conclude that one is better than the other or even that they're equal. Before we leave this, Harvey, I, I do want to say that um, I interviewed Jeff Carson last year for the podcast um, that was on episode 23, I believe. And, and I when I was discussing this with him, I asked him the question, um, how should people use the, 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 the AABB red cell practice guideline that had that clinical practice guidance that had just come out? I said, how should people use this? And, and I thought Jeff's response was very illuminating. Jeff, obviously, as you know, is a clinician as well. And he said, you know what, Joe, they should be doctors. They should pay attention. These are these are just these are just numbers. But the, the way that people should use this should should be to utilize all the clinical information at hand. I fear, though, that what you're saying is becoming more true, especially as administrators get involved in the so-called patient blood management movement. And I, I guess that's that's my concern that I wanted to, to let you elaborate on, Harvey. Are you concerned that this data, all this data that's come out, all these trials that have come out, one just came out recently with the same two arms, uh, you know, the the same two extremes in cardiac surgery. Um, Do you feel like we're in danger of misusing this data and becoming slaves to numbers and, and avoiding being doctors, basically? I think that's exactly the problem, and I'm even more concerned that the hospital administrator says to you, okay, uh, we can save $230,000 next year by using very, very restrictive transfusion. Don't you think we ought to do that? And so instead of looking at our patients, we're looking at the budget. Uh, Let me just say, Jeff Carson has been a, a friend of mine for I don't know how long, more than 30 years, and in fact, I was a consultant uh, on Jeff's first trial, the orthopedic surgery trial, and I suggested to Jeff at the time that he have a third arm and that it be a uh, standard care arm, and Jeff agreed with that, but it was funded by the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which said, you get only two arms. (laughs) Pick two. Uh, My personal feeling, and I think Jeff's a terrific clinician, and I absolutely agree with him that you look at the patient and not the numbers. I think Jeff should have picked two other arms, but uh, that's water under the bridge. If someone was if someone was trying to think of you know how can I how can I do a, a, a new study where do, where do we go from here? A better approach, I think, is uh, one that I recommended several years ago to the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and that is I think more effort ought to be expended into looking at physiologic measures to predict transfusion. Uh, why don't we do that? I mean, we have such great technology today, whether it's imaging or ultrasound, there, there have to be better ways than just looking at whether a patient is pale and whether their blood pressure goes down when they sit up to determine when we ought to give a red cell transfusion. And I think that we ought to be using perhaps a group of physiologic measures compared to, say, a transfusion trigger. And while, while I'm talking about that, let me just point out that in most of the studies using restrictive versus uh, uh, a higher hemoglobin, whatever that would be, many physicians would not enter their patients. Look at the number of patients who were screened and the number who were entered into the studies, and you'll be appalled. And perhaps that's because they didn't fit 
the criteria, but perhaps it's because they didn't believe that their patients were being adequately treated by putting them into arms where the major determinant of transfusion was a single number. Wow. That's uh, sobering and and I think really, really important information. I, uh, Harvey, I, we, have, we have covered, we've talked about the past. We've kind of talked about past into present. Now I'd kind of like to talk about present into future. And that brings us to, uh, well, really the, the paper that led me to, to contact you originally for, for this discussion. I, I realized shortly after we started talking that I wanted to talk about so much more with you. But, but I want to close our discussion with a paper that, that you published in uh, October of 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine called Crisis in the Sustainability of the U.S. Blood System with your co-authors uh, Chris Ruda and, and Jay Epstein. And I think that this, this paper is, is one that has, in my world, I'm currently in, in blood center world, um, has engendered a whole lot of conversation um, and, and really a whole lot of discussion on, on where we are in the U.S. blood system and, and where we're going. So I, I would love for you to take us through what your thought process was for why, you wanted to, why the three of you wanted to write this paper. And, and let's talk a little bit about some of the conclusions that you guys made as well. Well, I'm delighted that it's caused some uh, concern and discussion in the blood collecting community, but we had hoped that it might bring it to the attention of both the general medical public and the general public in general, but it hasn't uh, caused uh, as much interest from uh, the public press as we had hoped. The idea here was that uh, it has been known for several years now that as the red cell use has declined, the collectors of red cells have been increasingly under the gun in terms of their budgets. Uh, They're actually losing money, and most of the blood collectors in the United States are collecting at a loss. That is, it costs them more to produce red cells than it does to, uh, to than they get from uh, selling them to hospitals. Why is that? Well, is a number of different causes, but the, the main one is probably the way they're reimbursed. Blood has become a commodity. Uh, people uh, pay for it uh, the, the lowest amount they can by uh, having uh, contracts that are competitive. That's not such a bad thing in many areas, but what's happened is that if the competition is hyper-acute, then people will try to sell their product below cost in order to get uh, the contract. What happens there is, of course, that first of all, you get into a bare bones type of system where you can no longer afford to have excess blood available for an emergency because excess blood costs you money and you can't afford that. You also can't afford to invest in improvements in blood because the first thing to go when budgets get tight is R&D. So the idea of putting in new tests or of screening donors, say, for iron deficiency, which we know is a problem, and uh, preventing it, or doing a whole host of other things, suddenly you can't afford to do that. Every time someone says, well, shouldn't you test for iron levels? The answer is we can't afford to do that. That's a terrible answer. Uh, Or shouldn't we be testing for Zika virus? And the answer is, well, who's going to pay for it? So our system unlike many other systems around the world, is under fire because of the way it's currently designed. Well, and to, to what you just said, I would, I would also add, Harvey, the, the other objection that you hear from blood centers is, for example, why haven't you implemented pathogen reduction technology? Well, is it required? Hmm. And, and the decision often becomes... Unfortunately, um, as you said, because it's because of the financial implications, when, when something is mandated, then by God we'll do it. And before that, well, eh, the, the, and that that puts us all in a difficult position, don't you think? 
It does. And again, there are several issues there, but I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, maybe you know. Do you know when the first test for HIV was developed and available? Ooh, um, well, let's see. I won't put you on no, the spot. Okay. I, it was I, March. I would, I would guess oh, 80, 1982 or 83. March of 1985. Okay. Do you, do you know when it was mandated? <laughs> Later than that. <laughs> 1990. Oh, wow. So there was a five-year gap, but... By the end of 1985, every collector in the country was screening blood for HIV antibody. So it's a shame that you can't, it takes so long to get regulations into place that it's a shame that you have to wait for the regulation to do that. The other part of that, which I think is, again, shameful, is that if the FDA puts in a regulation, uh, the blood collectors all say, well, that's unfunded. That now, the FDA doesn't have money to fund the cost of their regulation. They're looking for safety and efficacy. But if they put in a mandate to do pathogen inactivation, then all the collectors say, we'll all go out of business because we can't. Who's going to pay for that? If we tell the hospital they need it, um, you know, they're, they're still going to just compete on the basis of price and we're going to go out of business. So it's really an inter- interesting an unfortunate conundrum that the way our system is set up and the way our system is uh, reimbursed, which I don't know whether people are familiar with this, but we're not reimbursed per unit of blood. And I I know that that's surprising to people, especially people just beginning in the field, but that's the, the, so, I mean, how is that possible? We, we send a unit of blood, uh, we send a unit of blood, a blood center sends a unit of blood out to a, out to a hospital is the, I, I know the blood center is not directly reimbursed from the patient's cost of care. Is the transfusion service reimbursed? No, it's not. Now, if, for example, if you do a procedure like a bone marrow transplant, you're reimbursed by the insurance company a certain amount, a DRG, a disease-related group amount. So it might be $250,000 for the bone marrow transplant. And now the hospital has to figure out how to use that money best. And so if they can cut down on the cost of blood, uh, then they have more money for other things, including uh, revenues over expenses. So they will negotiate with the blood center for a price for its blood, which may not represent what it costs the blood center to make it. So the, the hospital doesn't get paid for the blood. They get paid for this big procedure, part of which is blood. And the blood center doesn't get paid for what the insurance company pays. It gets paid what it negotiates with the hospital. And what, what's changed in recent years about hospitals uh, negotiating power? Well, hospitals have merged. We now have uh, medical centers which have uh, hospital networks, and it gives them a lot of bargaining power, and they've used it. Uh, And I suppose I would, too, if I were in that position. They've used it to make blood centers, especially the smaller blood centers, compete with one another on price. Many have gone out of business or have merged. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think our system had a lot of uh, fat in it, and making it leaner and meaner is probably a good thing. But you can go too far. And if you start cutting staff, especially staff who would be collectors, it's much harder to ramp up than it is to lay off. And as I said, you also eliminate R&D and decrease education and decrease a lot of the other services, which will be seen as fluff rather than as important services if if your cost is uh, uh, higher than your uh, reimbursement is. So uh, about a third of the people that listen to this podcast, Harvey, are are international folks, uh, mostly from Canada and the UK. So I'm sure that many of them are sitting there listening to our podcast 
part of this discussion and saying, well, the answer is obvious, guys, right? Uh, do do what do what we do, do and and t- have the government uh, have have it all be centralized. It's the entire blood collection system. So in your in your paper, I I believe that you express some doubt whether that would be something that would be that would work in the or that would be able to be done in the United States. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Well, I think that uh, the United States doesn't have a single payer medical system. So I think it's highly unlikely that it'd be uh, very willing to accept a single payer uh, system of blood collection and transfusion. There are other models, though, uh, and I think if you start from the standpoint that you have to pay at least the cost of producing a unit of red cells and add on to that the additional amount of money necessary so that you have enough uh, a- a- enough ability to respond to emergencies, so you have some surge capacity and enough so that you can do some R&D, then there are a number of, of methods which you can think about that could do that without having a single payer system. But yes, countries like uh, the United Kingdom and Canada and Switzerland, they have single uh, payer systems, some of which are governmental and others of which are not governmental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so in your paper, you you also you also make several suggestions, including some of the some of them that you've talked about. There's there's one I wanted to to mention to you and and get your feelings on, and it's it's kind of buried in there, but it's something that I guess it hits me hard as a as part of a as being part of a blood center, and that's the consignment model of blood allocation that where the the blood centers are actually financially responsible for blood in the hospital, whether they, it gets tra- transfused or not. Um, what's your feeling on on that and whether that's a sustainable model going forward. Well, I don't like that model, and it's a commonly used model for a variety of reasons. But what it means is, of course, that if the blood isn't used and it outdates for whatever reason, then the uh, blood center eats the cost. That would be fine if somehow it could roll that into the cost of the units that are used. But remember that the reimbursement for all the units that are used is based only on competition and not on the cost of what's transfused plus what's not transfused plus surge capacity. So, yes, I think instead of having the blood center at risk for whatever outdates, the blood center really needs to find a way to share that risk with its customers. It seems reasonable to me, but of course, uh, that changes the way that blood is uh, reimbursed. Well, Harvey, I would really strongly recommend that everyone take a a really good look at this paper. I'm going to put the link for it on the show page. Again, that will be at bbguy.org slash 045. And Harvey, I I really think it's a very important paper. And I hope that that maybe at least this podcast will get a a little more discussion within our community going about it. Sadly, I probably can't help you a lot with the lay press. (laughs) Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, but I, I hope it will because we recently looked at the 2017 data. The data in that paper come from 2016, and unfortunately, the trend is the same. That uh, the Red Cross, the largest collector of blood in the country, is still providing red cells at less than it costs them to prepare them, and uh, America's Blood Centers, which collects most of the rest of the blood in the country, is running either slightly above the cost of producing red cells, one and a half percent on the average, but a large number of their centers are still in the red. That's not a good model for a national resource. It is not. That is for sure. Well, Harvey, this has been this has been remarkable for me. I, I am so honored again that you would that you would spend an hour with me and, and discuss all these different things that we've that we've covered. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Any any brilliant words of wisdom do you want to leave us with? I'm not sure they're brilliant words of wisdom, but I, I want to uh, let people know that when I got into this discipline many, many years ago, it was so exciting. There were new things happening, blood cell separators, uh, transfusion transmitted infection that we could interdict. Uh, the only test at the time was a test for syphilis and an agar gel diffusion for hepatitis B. We've come a long way. We're still there now. There are so many exciting things with cellular therapies, with uh, genomics, with uh, 
information systems that can look at big data and analyze it. It's a time where for young people coming into this profession, not only are you going to be able to uh, really help patients who require transfusion and cellular therapies, but you're going to be able to make enormous advances. And I just like to encourage people to uh, think of this as, as an exciting area of, of medicine and, uh, and take advantage. Grab it by both hands. That's awesome. Well, Harvey, thank you again so much. I, I, I am so grateful and so honored that you joined me on the podcast today. You're quite welcome. It's been a pleasure. Not sure there's much of anything I can say to add to that, you guys. I hope that you understand you've just heard from someone with more experience and wisdom than I probably will ever have in my entire life. You may not agree with everything Dr. Klein said, and I know that some would argue with with some of his thoughts about the restrictive versus liberal red cell transfusion trials in particular. But let me just say this, to use a baseball analogy, the man has lost nothing on his fastball, and it's been mm, such an honor to have him. So thank you very much for listening. I've got some more good stuff coming, including just some episodes coming up on a discussion on the top five changes to ABB standards coming. That's in the next episode. Uh, an episode on transfusion transmitted CMV, bloodless medicine, therapeutic apheresis, and in episode 50, the return of the very great Sue Johnson to discuss the essentials of pre-transfusion testing. I can't wait, and I really hope to see you soon. So until then, I hope as always that you smile and have fun, and above all, never ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time. 